This is FRM Part 1, Book 1, Foundations of Risk Management and the Building Blocks of Risk Management. Before we get into the building blocks, I ought to tell you a little bit about myself so that you don't uh, suspect that I'm acting like George Costanza in that one great Seinfeld episode where he uh, passes himself off as an expert in risk management and gets hired as a mentor. I do have some credentials here. Um, I do hold a PhD in finance. Uh, my degree is 1993. And about 10 years later, I completed the CFA program. I have a BS in accounting. Uh, that's pretty relevant. And then I have an MS in finance. And when I was in my doctoral program, I took multiple PhD level courses in econometrics. And, and since then, I've taught at a variety of institutions, um, corporate finance, international finance. But what's probably most relevant for you guys is my experience in teaching investments and derivative securities at both the undergraduate and the graduate level. Uh, as you can imagine, risk management is pretty integral part of those two topics. And so we'll talk a lot about investments and derivative securities. And I will regularly say to you guys, hey, this is something that I teach my students in class every day. Now, another important issue is that uh, I have created one video per chapter for this financial risk manager exam. And what I do in these videos is I, I try to I try to link, you know, the breadth of the material with the depth of the material. And I'm always tempted as a pure academic to present all of the stuff, all of the material. But I, I realize I can't do this in one of these videos. So I try to I try to get as much as I can into a 20, 30, sometimes sometimes a 40 minute video. Uh, what I like to do is I, I'm a big I'm a big James Bond fan and Seinfeld fan, a big sports fan. I have four children, and so what I like to do is I like to give stories and analogies that are sports related or comedy related, so that you can remember them, which might help you answer a question on exam. In fact, I challenge you uh, uh, to tell me that these won't these examples won't help you on an exam. So we have lots and lots of videos to watch. Um, let's go ahead and talk specifically, just briefly, about the uh, FRM exams. You know, you'll, you'll take a part one and a part two, May and November. And I think that, uh, I think GARP is recommending you guys study for, I think it's 240 hours that I recently saw on their webpage. I know when I went through the CFA program, uh, the Institute recommended like 250 hours. Now I think it's up to 300 hours. I mean, the whole point of this um, is that this is not something that you're going to do over the weekend. I mean, this is a long process. And hopefully these videos will provide you with, you know, some fundamentals and some links and a toolbox so that when you sit down on the exam with your lunch pail, you can reach in and pull out a hammer and pull out a screwdriver when you need it to solve a specific problem. And so over the next multitude of videos, we will cover all of the chapters in part one and part two and all of those books. Now, when you register for the FRM exam, I'm guessing you're aware that you get these official books with all of the chapters. There are some practice questions in there. And uh, interestingly and ironically enough, when I prepare for these videos, I go ahead and I look at those chapters and I read those chapters and some of them are this long and some of them are this long and we try to condense it. Um, you know, look at the challenge there under that third block point. The amount of content and formulas included in these books uh, is substantial. Now you also have access for a fee to some practice questions uh, through GARP. But what Analyst Prep does for you is provide, you know, kind of a summary and a condensation of all of the material that you get from the official books, puts it into a framework under which you can efficiently study. 
because let, let's face it, I mean, you could study, you could study for a thousand hours for one of these exams and still not pass if you're watching TV and playing Fortnite or jamming to rock and roll music or whatever it is. So we've got to do this efficiently. There are tons and tons of questions in the question bank and the mock exams are very effective. Now, every chapter starts with learning objectives. And so the, the first slide that I show uh, in these slide decks and in these videos is a just a repeat of what these learning objectives are. I don't read them to you every time because, of course, you can read them yourself. But what I will do is I'll try to highlight some of the learning objectives so that there's kind of a theme throughout the video. If I were to choose a theme in this first introductory chapter, I, I would say the following. And I teach my students this in, in all of my classes, not just investments and derivative securities. Now, these are my terms, but you'll see how they're uh, layered inside of the FRM terminology as we go through this first slide deck. But I tell students in order to be effective risk managers, you have to identify the risks, you have to quantify the risks, and then you have to manage the risks. And that has lots and lots to do with these learning objectives. Look at what we're going to do here. Explain the concept of risk, evaluate tools and procedures, risk and reward, identify key classes of risk and look at some risk factors. So we're going to cover all of this stuff in the slide. And in every slide deck, you'll see that we pretty much cover every one of those learning objectives. Some, of course, are more important than others. Some, of course, are way more testable than others. So let's go ahead and start with the basic definition, risk and, man and its management. What is risk? And I love this first definition. It's the potential variability of returns around an expected return. Let's go back to our very first stats class when we calculated the mean return and then our professor said something like, oh, we can all also call that the expected return. So expected return and mean return or mean outcome is somewhere in the middle, right? If it's a normal distribution, it's precisely in the middle. And a great definition of risk is that potential variability around that mean. I mean, for example, if the mean is right here, and let me just point to the to a space here. If the mean is right here and we have a uh, hundred observations and those hundred observations are all right around the mean, well, we can say that, boy, there's probably not much risk in this particular investment. But if the mean is right here in this space and the potential res returns are all the way like this, well, then we might say, boy, we don't have any idea what's going on. All right. So we can measure risk by variability. And of course, the only way, the only way that we can get compensated, the only way that we can demand a return is by taking risk. And we're going to talk at length throughout these uh, chapters about the linear relationship between risk and return and the nonlinear relationship between risk and return. Now, one of the things that I emphasize in my derivative securities class is that in order, in order for individual investors and institutional investors to be able to effectively manage risk, they have to be able to price those risks. And so we're going to take a look at lots and lots of pricing models so that we know exactly what kind of compensation that we can demand for each given level of risk. Now, look at the bottom there. I have two blue words, risk, variability that can be quantified in terms of probabilities, uncertainty, variability that cannot be quantified at all. Let me give you my first sports example. You know, I'm a gigantic basketball fan, and so I, I, I can watch the NBA games and I can watch and marvel at LeBron James. But let's focus on just his foul shooting skills. So what we can do is we can observe his foul shooting performance during the course of a season. And we count for a make and we count for a miss. And let's just suppose that LeBron is shooting foul shots at about 80 percent. So what can we say that if LeBron is going into the playoffs, we can make some type of an inference that say, you know what, LeBron shot 80 percent during the season. He's probably going to shoot around 80 percent during the course of the playoffs. That makes perfect sense. So let's define risk as that variability of LeBron's performance in the playoffs. And we're going to use a sample of his performance during the regular season. 
Now let's look at the mechanics of a foul shot here. I think this is pretty an interesting analogy. You know, the, the referee hands uh, LeBron the ball and he stands there and he dribbles and he takes a deep breath. And remember, there are people, there are players on each team on the foul lane. There are a couple of refs out there. There are fans in the stands screaming their heads off either for or against him. And LeBron shoots it, right? So we could say something like, you know, he has an 80% chance of making any individual foul shot. All right, so that's risk. But what about uncertainty? Let's suppose that LeBron is dribbling and dribbling. And right when he gets the ball up here, now he started his motion, so he can't stop it. Right when he gets up here, the lights in the arena go out and LeBron continues his follow through and shoots the basket to the ba shoots the basketball to the basket that's uncertainty the something the variability that cannot be quantified i mean if this would happen everyone would say oh imagine that we never could have imagined that such a thing would happen and this is going to be really important when we talk about things like expected loss and value at risk when we're a financial institution and we have a 500 million dollar portfolio and one day one day we lose lose $200 million out of that. And we all look at each other and say, oh, imagine that. How did that possibly happen? So the lights going out for LeBron is very similar to the lights going out back in the 2007 and to 2009 financial crisis. But we need to be prepared for when the lights go out. So this is essentially risk management, you know, kind of on my terminology and my examples. Now, of course, to be effective and highly skilled risk managers, we can't just lump all risks into uh, into the same category. You know, for example, it's pouring down rain outside as I'm as I'm uh, recording this video. And what are some risks? I mean, if I don't want to get wet, I, I take an umbrella outside. But there are other risks, too. The wind could blow the umbrella out. I could step in a puddle and get my new shoes all wet. I could trip and fall and ruin my new suit. I mean, there are all sorts of risks. So so we need to classify them. And of course, uh, Anybody who wants to classify risks can put together some gigantic flow chart. So we're going to start over at the left hand side and then we're going to work our way all the way over to the right hand side. Let's start with market risks. Now, market risk has these four components, equity price risk, interest rate risk, currency risk, and commodity price risk. And we're going to look at the, these risks in the next slide. But I want you to think of these as risks associated with your turning on the television or going to a website at, let's say, noon and observing what's happening on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And of course, the first thing that you'll hear is, oh, the Dow is up 100 or the Dow is down 20 or whatever that number is. And so that variability in the Dow, that variability in the prices of those 30 uh, blue chip stocks can be summarized by those four risks. Why do those prices go up or down? Equity price risk, there are functions of interest rates. Of course, corporations, they sell their goods and services across uh, country lines. And then we have to worry about things like uh, the price of oil and the price of sugar and the price of cocoa. All right, so let's go ahead and divide these into, into their two component parts. All right. Notice what I have in that first block point. Market risk, potential reduction in value due to changes in financial market prices and rates. All right. That's what we talked about in that previous slide. But let's go ahead and decompartmentalize. So we have two components here. We have the general market risk component, which look at that definition I have under the blue box. It's the variability in returns due to changes in economic information. What are some great examples of economic information? Things like interest rates, things like changes in uh, GDP, things like who is in charge of the Congress or who is the president or the premier or the chancellor. Um, things like exchange rates, things like oil prices, etc., etc. Those are market variables that are probably going to have similar impacts on all of those financial securities. Now separate that from the specific market risk component, and let's talk about this as the variability in returns due to firm-specific information. You know, let's take a company like uh, like Procter & Gamble. What does Procter & Gamble do? They, they produce lots and lots of products that we use every day for personal hygiene. 
Procter & Gamble's success, and remember, they've been doing this for a long, long time, uh, its success is due to the fact that, you know, we like to feel clean and we like to be clean and, and uh, we don't want to offend anybody, you know, so we buy the shampoo and the toothpaste and all that kind of stuff. Well, variability in returns due to firm-specific information. We have different tastes. We have different supply and demand conditions facing us when we buy shampoo or soap. And so Procter & Gamble's stock price is going to fluctuate depending on how many bars of soap that we want to buy this week. But it also fluctuates based on interest rates and inflation and all those general market component factors that I talked about just, uh, just a few moments ago. All right, so remember, there's two types of risk, general market risk and specific market risk. Now, of course, of course, investors are not going to hold just one share of stock inside of their portfolio. They're going to diversify. And this is where this is where it gets really, really interesting. Um, that general market risk component is known as systematic risk, the risk of the economic system. All right. Think of it that way. But if you have a portfolio of let's just suppose you have the Dow 30 stocks in your portfolio and let's suppose that there's bad news associated with the economy. Maybe one day the central banker wakes up and says, you know what, interest rates are 2%. I think they ought to be 4%. So I'm going to unexpectedly double the interest rates. Well, this is bad news for all sorts of financial securities out there. So all 30 stocks in your portfolio are going to fall. That is systematic risk. And what we're going to find out here in a future chapter is that, boy, when we rely on diversification, it's probably not going to help us during those market downturns. Now, what does diversification do? What diversification do, and this is why I say in the very last sentence there, uh, uh, diversification virtually eliminates this specific market risk component. Academics call this unsystematic risk. Uh, your chapter refers to it as idiosyncratic or specific risk. So think about this. You have this portfolio of 30 or 50 or 80 stocks, and what is this portfolio fluctuating based on? What you have done is by diversifying, you have eliminated the variability in returns due to that firm specific information. You've removed that component. Notice at the bottom, I have virtually eliminated. That's uh, that's uh, that's an academic term. And that was uh, that was a, a term virtually that was used way, way before uh, virtually is used these days. But what's left then is the variability in your portfolio due to changes in economic information. So essentially, when you buy and you invest in a portfolio of stocks or bonds, you are investing in the economy. When the economy expands, chances are those firms and those stocks in your portfolio will realize price appreciation. Now let's go ahead and quickly uh, summarize this market risk. So I just spent good time talking about equity price risk, but how about how about interest rate risk? This is what we know when interest rates go up, almost all securities will fall in value, especially fixed income securities. And that's the example that I have there in the second uh, circle point under interest rate risk. When interest rates rise, bond values fall. And so the portfolio with bonds are most definitely going to experience a loss in value Except, I mean, there are some bonds out there that don't do that. But in general, that's going to be the case. Now, of course, corporations, they are just not simply domestic supply and demanders. You know, a company like Coca-Cola, you know, gets, oh, 70 or 80 or maybe even more percent of its cash flows generated by uh, sales of its products out outside of the United States. So Coca-Cola's U.S. dollar cash flow report is sensitive to the rate of exchange between the U.S. dollar and all of these currencies out there. And of course, when the U.S. dollar depreciates in value, that's good news for Coca-Cola because then it can take those cash flows generated in the stronger currency, right, somewhere in Europe or somewhere in Asia, and they can convert them into lots and lots of U.S. dollars. And they can show lots and lots of operating cash flows. So a depreciating U.S. dollar is good for U.S. global firms.
And then finally, we need to worry about the price of commodities. You know, uh, let's take a look at a simple example. What do companies like Delta and Southwest do every day? They they fly their airplanes and so they have to pull up to the gas station every day. They're buying fuel constantly. Well, if the price of oil goes from $50 a barrel to $100 or better yet, how about the $150 a barrel that uh, oil was selling to a decade ago? What does that do to Southwest Airlines and Delta Airlines cash flows? Well, uh, obviously, it reduces those and probably pro probably reduces those in, by a substantial amount. Now, one thing we'll learn as we go along here is that these companies like Delta and Southwest Airlines, they they use derivative contracts to hedge that commodity price risk. That's going to be a really fun lecture sometime in the future. How about if we move on to credit risk? So credit risk sounds an awful lot like something that you and I are probably exposed to, and, and that's true. Whenever we go down to the bank to borrow money to buy a car or buy a house, they do kind of a tr credit check on us, take a look at our credit score. Well, credit risk as it applies uh, in our chapter rely, uh, is based almost completely on the issuers of bonds and the risk of not being able to generate cash flows to be able to repay that bond issue. So who, who issues bonds? Businesses issue bonds like Procter & Gamble and governments issue bonds like the U.S. Treasury Department or municipalities issue bonds as well. And so when we're dealing with credit risk, we have to worry about a couple of things. So let's just start with bankruptcy risk. That's the, that's the inability to meet the interest and principal payments and then downgrade risk, of course, these ratings agencies like Moody's and Standard & Poor's and Fitch, they rate those bonds, which is kind of like the credit score that, that we possess when we go down and borrow money from a bank. All right, so let's go and take a, a little bit of a closer look here. Classification, all right, bankruptcy risk. This is the risk associated with the borrower's inability to pay the debt. Now, if this is a company like Procter & Gamble, who's issued tons and tons of bonds to finance the purchase of its machinery and all of its equipment. And if for some reason it can't repay that debt, well, that's why we have to go into bankruptcy proceedings. You know, we have chapter seven and chapter 11 and chapter 13 bankruptcy. And so a judge in the US court system will come in and try to figure out what's the best way to clear that debt but essentially, it works just like a, a repossession. You know, if, if you or I fail to make our car payments, the banker comes in and kind of steals our car. You know, they don't steal it because they own the title. But they take our car, not because they like our car, not because they, they want to drive our car, but they're going to sell it. So what the judge does in bankruptcy proceedings is he can say to the corporation, hey, here's this machine over here that you use to make soap, right, Procter & Gamble, sell that and pay off the bondholders. Now, it works a little bit differently when we're talking about uh, government debt. Now, with the U.S. government debt, you know, we pretty much believe that that's risk free, so there is no chance of bankruptcy. But uh, municipalities and government sponsored entities, they can clearly default on their uh, on their bond issue. That's why we have this uh, downgrade risk. So Moody's and Standard and Standard and Poor's and Fitch come in and they rate the bonds. You know, the bonds go from AAA, which is super, super safe, all the way down to D, which means that a bond is currently in default, not making any interest, not making any principal payments. Well, these ratings agencies, they keep track of the credit risk of the issuer over time. And when they foresee a problem with the ability of the issuer to repay that bond at some time in the future, they might downgrade the risk. So if the bond is downgraded from, let's say, double B to single B, well, that must mean there's more risk, right? Then bondholders are going to require more return. That means a higher yield to maturity and a lower bond price. So do you see how this credit risk is related to price risk? You see how the downgrade risk is related to price risk. Now let's take a look at a couple of issues here. Credit worthiness of the borrower. You know, if Procter & Gamble comes to the market and wants to issue a $500 million, 
in a bond issue, you know, the investment banking community would yawn. They would say, you know, Procter & Gamble, you've been around for a thousand years. You're probably going to be around for another thousand years. You know, that's pretty much a really, really safe bond. But if I go to the marketplace, suppose I, I'm starting Jim Soap Company and all I have is my chemist outfit and I'm just, you know, putting stuff together and I make a bar of soap and I want to borrow $500 million. Well, the investment banking community, they might not yawn. They may just slam the phone down and say, Jim, you got to be kidding me. How can I take that risk? Now, of course, we need to worry about state of the economy, right? When the economy is booming, then then banks are much more willing to lend out their capital because if the economy is expanding, then there are more positive net present value projects out there for all of those companies and all those business to grab a hold of, which means they'll have a higher probability of repaying the bond issue. Now, the flip side of that, of course, is this is the problem with recession. You know, this is the big deal with recession. It's not so much just the word recession. It, it's not just so much that the economy is contracting, but it is the consequences of an economic contraction, meaning that borrowers are not making as much as they used to, and therefore they're probably more likely not to be able to repay the bond issue. Now, notice the middle one in there under issues, concentration risk. Um, I mentioned diversification in that previous slide, and we need to consider the concentration of the financial institution in terms of what its assets look like. I mean, if I'm, if I'm a bank, if I'm Jim's bank, and all I do is I make loans to individuals who want to buy houses that are valued at between 100,000 and 200,000 and none of these people have permanent jobs so to speak and they have lots and lots of other expenses and I specialize in this market because I want to be able to charge them a higher interest rate and I feel like I'm smart enough to figure out who's going to be able to repay and who's not going to be able to repay. Well, my asset portfolio is probably not too diversified. And so if I go issue a bond, then those uh, ratings agencies are going to come in and say, you know what, Jim, your, your asset base, you know, they pretty much looks homogeneous. If one defaults, probably all the other ones are going to default. Next one is liquidity risk. And I bet you guys remember that word liquidity from your very early accounting days. Back as an undergraduate student, liquidity just simply means how quickly can you turn an asset into cash? And the idea is not, can you turn the asset into cash so you can go out and spend the cash? The idea is because you have these obligations that are coming due. Can you turn an accounts receivable? Can you turn inventory? Can you turn other short-term assets into cash so that you can meet those short-term liabilities that are coming due? All right, so that's the first block point there. Meet short-term financial needs. Let's talk about funding and trading. So. Um, Remember, when businesses buy and sell to and from each other, they pretty much have these terms of trade. So they'll say something like, look, I'll let you have I'll have I'll let you have all, all of my materials if you agree to pay me in five days or 10 days or 15 days, whatever it is. So when that comes due, that comes due, you have an accounts payable. Can you meet it? Can you meet it when they are due funding liquidity risk? But then there's this trading liquidity risk. Let's suppose that as a financial institution, you have access to the commercial paper market or you have access to the repurchase agreement market. And so you may have some of these financial securities and you may be relying on those to satisfy some of your obligations. Well, let's suppose that you go to sell one of these financial securities and there are no there are no buyers. <laughs> And you have to discount your price and you have to substantially discount your price. So if you owe this person over here $100 and you have to sell your asset for $80, 80 doesn't equal 100. And the person to whom you owe that capital is probably not going to be happy when you call and say, hey, will you take 80 because, all right, so we got to manage this funding and manage the trading liquidity risks. How about operational risks? These are the risks of operations. I mean, that makes perfect sense. 
And the focus here in this part of the chapter is, uh, is the weaknesses that arise from those operations. You know, I remember back in my introductory management class, oh my gosh, this was back in 1981 or so, when the professor gave us this flow chart and it was kind of a perfect flow chart of, of the operations of a business. And you know, you start here and you bring in your customers and you satisfy your customers and then you uh, draw down on inventory and you do all this stuff and then there's a sale at the end. And so you go through all that operation. And in that first class, it was always it was always like a picture perfect scenario, a perfect outcome that you do this and this and this, and then you have the sale and you can generate the profit. But of course, there is going to be such events like a management failure, like faulty controls or inadequate systems or some other operational weakness. Your textbook chapter mentions a few of these here anti-money laundering risk. You know, one of the responsibilities of the uh, financial services industry is to prevent criminals from disguising illegally obtained funds as legitimate income. One of the things you'll hear from me throughout these videos is I'm an avid reader reading a fiction book now where these uh, bank robbers are robbing small banks in small uh, southern U.S. towns, and they have it all planned out. And uh, the police and everyone is saying, boy, these criminals are really smart. We're going to have to be really smart or they're going to have to make a mistake before we can catch them. And so that was I was thinking about this uh, as I was preparing the video that, of course, this makes perfect sense. We need we need to have a model in place, a system in place so that so that when they make that mistake, we catch them right away. Uh, cyber attacks, this is an obvious notion here, model risk. Uh, we're going to talk about this at length uh, throughout all of these multiple videos in the relatively near future. Um, we have these models and we can input some data into the models and, and we can process the model and then we can look at the output and we can evaluate and make inferences based on that output. But but if it's stinky data going in, we're going to have stinky output coming out. And so we have to have a model that reflects reality. And this is a big challenge for us. And then finally, how about business strategic and reputational risk? These, these are obvious ones here. So business risk. Um, in the academic world, we call business risk as really the variability in operating income. So think of Think of the income statement for a business. You start with revenues, which is just P times Q, right? Price times quantity. So you have all those revenues up here and then you have all of the expenses. Uh, and those expenses are things like wage expense and uh, variable input expense, et cetera, et cetera. So if you subtract those two numbers, you're going to get operating income. Business risk is the variability in operating income. Maybe we'll sell more or less than what we think. Maybe it will cost us more or less than what we think. Now, remember, the strategic plan from a business generally comes from the board of directors. Of course, this is true for publicly held corporations, but it's, it's true for most businesses. The, the corporate strategy comes from a group of leaders, right, who know what the core business is and says, we have this vision, this is what we want to do, and this is how we're going to get there. Now, of course, that means that there are going to be substantial investments being made into these assets, right? I mean, if you think about a company like Harley Davidson, if you've ever been to a Harley Davidson manufacturing, manufacturing facility, they have these gigantic metal stamping machines. And these metal stamping machines, they turn out a Harley Davidson motorcycle. Well, they don't cost, you know, a couple hundred dollars. I mean, these are hundreds of millions, sometimes millions, billions of dollars of investment. And then reputational risk, we all know what that is. I'm hoping and guessing that many of you are old enough to uh, to remember, you know, kind of the father of reputational risk, which was the Enron debacle, which occurred. I mean, this is 20 years ago or so. Now, of course, if I went back to that very first uh, that very first flow charted slide, you know, we have lots and lots of risks over there on the right hand side. It would be one thing if I were to be able to say to you, you know, these risks are independent of each other. 
This risk up here doesn't affect this risk down here and here and here. And of course, that's that's not true. Look at that first block point. Risks can flow from one type to another. We can start with credit risk, which, of course, is what happened in the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis. I mean, this started, you know, some people say it started in the mortgage backed security market, which started because of uh, lots and lots of loans to homeowners who couldn't afford the homes that they were buying. So they bid up the price of housing. So this was kind of a bubble that led into a liquidity crisis because of the securitization of these mortgage securities. And then we weren't quite sure what they were valued at. Well, you can't buy or sell financial security if you don't know what its intrinsic value is. And then that has repercussions into the entire market. So you start with, I mean, think about it. You start with one individual like me, poor Jim, I can't pay off my mortgage. What does that happen? My mortgage was sold, put into a pool of mortgages, into a mortgage-backed security, and I'm not the only one who can't pay off his or her home loan. And so we can't sell that mortgage-backed security. And then the people on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, they, they look over into the mortgage-backed security market and they say, wait a minute, no one's buying or selling over there. That has to mean something to us over here. So on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and in the NASDAQ market, those bid and ask prices uh, the difference between those two widens. So we flow logically. And sometimes it's like this, right? It's not like credit risk happens today, liquidity risk happens next month, and market risk happens next year. I mean, these things, uh, they're like the dominoes. Here's this first thing that I was talking about at the very first slide. What did I say to you? We need to identify the risks. We need to quantify the risks. And we need to manage the risk. Well, this is your chapter's way of formalizing, you know, my kind of little self-made example. So notice we've got identify, then we're going to analyze, then we're going to manage, and then we're going to assess. So identifying these risks means that we give them a name, we categorize them, we understand uh, what they are. Then we analyze them so we can give them a credit score. We can rank them, but we're going to measure them and we can measure them by a couple of different ways. I mean, you know, we'll talk about beta of a share of stock. We'll talk about duration for a bond. Uh, we'll talk about value at risk. I mean, there's lots and lots of ways to measure and to measure these particular types of risk. And then we quantify them with our particular portfolio. And then how do we manage these risks? Well, a couple of different ways. I, I, had, a, I had a friend who uh, was afraid of flying and went to a therapist and the therapist said, well, don't ever get on an airplane again. And I thought, boy, that's a simple risk management uh, solution, right? You could just simply avoid it or you can just get on the airplane, right? You can retain it or you can, uh, you can mitigate it by, you know, going through the process of, you know, figuring stuff out, however that works take some medicine, whatever it is, or you could pay someone else to fly for you. And that's really the cool one here in this manage the risk, the transfer. We're going to use lots of derivative securities to transfer the risk to somebody who, who wants to take that risk. And then, of course, the last step is, is to assess. And I don't ignore that in my three part process. But, uh, you know, this one tells us that, all right, this is what we've done so far. How good were we in doing those first three things? And so here's a pretty much a summary of what I just described, right? Uh, closing down a business unit. I mean, this happens all the time. I tell my students regularly to uh, to read the Wall Street Journal. Most most of them don't, but uh, you know, business units are being closed down all the time. Uh, accepting the riskiness of the project when we retain it, um, mitigation and risk transfer. I think we've covered all that stuff. Uh, this is an interesting little picture here. Um, risk managers should not concentrate on known risks only, but also the unknown risks. And I see this and I observe this regularly as I'm watching football and basketball on television. And as my children have aged through basketball and soccer and golf, and I see coaches and coaching strategy. And oftentimes I'll say to myself, you know what, that decision indicates to me that that coach really doesn't know anything. And that coach does not know what he or she does not know. And nothing is 
uh, irks me more than this past season in football where coaches are going for two uh, when they should not go for two. That's an unknown unknown. But let's work our way down. You know, this is more important here, the known unknown. So we have to be smart enough to know what we don't know. We need to know what our weaknesses is or what our weaknesses are so we can go back and catch those bank robbers when they try to rob another bank in my earlier example. Then we're going to get into this computation. We can compute the unexpected loss and we're going to compute the unexpected loss. Now we'll do that at length in a future chapter, but we can do it, you know, kind of simple form here in this chapter. Let's go ahead and talk about an expected loss. Remember when I use that term expected value or expected return early in this slide deck, it means it implies that it is the one in the middle. It's the mean. So look at that first block point. Expected loss can be defined as the mean loss an investor might expect to experience from a portfolio. All right, so what do we have? We have, uh, we have expected loss as a function of three variables, probability of default. And so that's going to be based on our assessment of what are the chances that this issuer is not going to be able to make the next coupon payment, right? Probability of default. So that's going to be right, a decimal, like 5% or 25%. Uh, the loss given default is going to be, it's also a, a percent, but it's going to be the amount of the loss uh, as a function of the amount of the uh, total loan. So that's a percent too. And then we'll multiply it by the exposure at default, which will be a dollar amount or some currency. So look at that formula there, that equation in the blue box, the expected loss is equal to the exposure at default times the loss given default times the probability of default. And the reason that this is so important is so we can determine what those interrelationships are. In other words, is one a positive function of the other or is it a negative function of the other? And then we can figure out what their interactions are and calculate maybe a correlation coefficient. Now, the unexpected loss is going to be the average total loss over and above the expected loss. Now you can think about it as the variation or the variability in that expected loss. And we're going to use uh, standard deviation many, many times in these chapters as a measure of risk. And it's a great measure of risk, not just in the financial services industry, but in the medical field and the engineering field. Standard deviation is really important. Think about it this way. If we have a mean right here, and all the objects are right here, right? Okay, well, that's a low standard deviation. Didn't I do this before? If it's like this, that's a high standard deviation. So of course, investing in a treasury bond has a very low, very low standard deviation. In fact, if you hold that treasury bond until it matures, you will have no standard deviation. You'll get exactly what the federal government promises you. But if you buy a share of stock in Procter & Gamble, those possible outcomes are going to be somewhere around that mean. They'll be pretty close to it because Procter & Gamble is a stable stock. But a company like uh, Citrix Systems, man, you have no idea what you're going to get in the future. Value at risk. I mentioned this a time or two in the early part of the slide deck. Uh, this is going to be really important as we move through book one and book two. All right, it's a statistical measure that defines a particular level of loss in terms of chances of occurrence. And we're going to call this a confidence level. And this is what value at risk is going to sound like. All right. We might have a position that uh, has a one day value at risk of one million dollars at the 95 percent confidence level. What that means then is that we only have a five percent, right? one minus 95, we only have a 5% probability to incur a loss that is greater than $1 million on any given trading day. Now this value at risk, this tells us a lot about risk, right? So we need to quantify, we need to manage, we need to do all that stuff. Look at the picture there. So I have a normal distribution, <laughs> picture of a normal distribution, a bell-shaped curve. That value at risk is way, way over in the left tail. We're going to be really interested in the left hand tail of the distribution. We want to know how heavy that is, right? We want to know how far it pushes over 
to the mean. Value at risk kind of summarizes these extreme losses that occur with very low probabilities. Now, one of the interesting things about uh, these chapters and this particular chapter and the end of this chapter is that we can do all the math that we want to do, right? I mean, the technical analysis and the and the mathematics of this will lead us to a conclusion, right? So we can say one plus one equals two. But there's the human element that injects some extra variables that may lead to imperfect outcomes. So look at my first uh, block point. Many financial firms, how about if I say, uh, how about if I say all financial firms should employ three ways to control you know, this agency and this conflict of interest. I mean, we're always, always exposed to these potential conflicts of interest. And then the human agency of, boy, you know, what's our goal in life as a human agent, as an individual decision maker, to maximize our own wealth, right? We learned this in microeconomics. Individuals will make decisions based on their own self-interest. But if we're an agent for a financial institution, what's our goal? Maximize the wealth of the owners. All right, so what are these three ways? These are important. Create business models that can identify and manage risk. I've emphasized that for the past 30 minutes or so. And here's the thing, employing risk managers that are qualified in risk management. And it's because of that second point right there that I mentioned George Costanza in my introduction. George said that uh, risk management may have been on his resume, so he lied about his skill set. He had no business mentoring somebody in risk management. Ah, so now we need this internal audit, this third part here. Periodic, independent oversight and assurance. And so think about think about what this uh, these three ways uh, to manage this human agency and the conflicts of interest. It's really, it's really just having somebody stand there and make certain that the process is working and that there are no gaps in the process. And this is how I try to raise my children as a father. You know, I emphasize lots and lots of things like I'm sure that you guys do, but one of the things that I emphasize is this word integrity. Always make decisions as if mom or dad are standing over your shoulder. That's the definition of integrity. And that's why the GARP, they emphasize integrity in all of their ethics models. And so if you can employ risk managers who act with integrity, then all of this stuff is manageable. I'm not saying it's not going to exist and there are all sorts of challenges, but it's manageable. Uh, what do I have down there? Cornerstone of risk management, grasping the role of human agency. All right, that makes sense. How about, uh, how about trying to sum or aggregate the risk? I mean, is it possible to look at a financial institution's asset portfolio or liability portfolio and just say, okay, one and two and three and four, so we have five. Is it possible to do that? And, and the answer is, well, sometimes it is, and, and sometimes it's not. Um, here, look at that first block point. Market risks are easily quantified and controlled by comparing the notional amount in each, each asset. We'll talk at length about how to change the notional at some time in the future. Now, it's difficult to achieve because, because a bond and a stock and a loan to a local business and a loan to Procter & Gamble, these are all going to have different volatilities. So while part of it is relatively straightforward, another part of it is not. Now, when we get into derivative securities, in, in particular options, we're going to look at things like Delta and Gamma and Vega. These are known as the Greeks. So what we can do is we can compute these Greeks, and it's, the, it's, it's just a, an output of the great uh, Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model, but you can't add the Vega to the Delta uh, and try to apply them at the enterprise level. What we do sometimes is compute this value at risk that I just told you about a few moments ago, but 
value at risk ignores the magnitude of the loss. It's one thing to say, you know what, we only have a 5% chance of losing more than 1 million, but may, are we going to lose 1.1 million or are we going to lose 1.1 trillion? Value at risk doesn't really help us uh, in that fashion, but don't fret. Uh, we have a solution for that later on uh, in one of those chapters. Boy, this is a great picture here, right? What do we know? We know we know that if you take more risk or if you're forced to take more risk, the only way you will do that is if you're compensated in greater amounts, right? So higher, higher expected returns, higher demanded returns, of course, of course, mean that for those high risk projects, we're going to have higher demand. Now, what we can do is we can take the ratio of reward over risk, and that's what both of those formulas do, essentially. Um, but if this ratio is higher than the cost of equity capital, not the cost of capital, but the cost of equity capital, then the portfolio is probably valuable to the investor. Now, one of the things that is easy to do as a manager of a financial institution is to view the assets and the liabilities in terms of their silos. So you have a mortgage silo here, you have a bond silo here, you have business loan silo here, you have personal loan silo here, and you just look at all of those. And so you put somebody in charge of each of those silos. Well, the problem with managing those silos independently is that their outputs, their outcome, their cash flows are not, they are not independent. And that's why we have this concept of enterprise risk management. So we can have, we can have silos, but we need to have an umbrella or a link between and among these silos. So look at this ERM process of planning, organized, leading and controlling the activities of an organization in order to minimize the effect of risk on an organization's capital. So it overcomes the challenge of that siloed management where each unit is uh, of an institution manages its own risk independently. And so it makes sense for this manager over here under the mortgage wing to be an expert in mortgages. But that manager also has to know that credit risk depends on something over here. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the business loan portfolio or maybe it's something else. So look at those points there. Risk is multidimensional. So while these silo managers have to be experts in their own silo, they also have to be inter-experts between and among. Specialized judgment, of course, statistical science application. Notice this risk develops across all risk types. I think that takes us through our learning objectives. And if you quickly glance over those, you'll see that we, uh, we did cover all that stuff. Have a great day.